Hello everyone, today I've got something really cool to show you. It's called a television and it allows you to see pictures that are really far away as if they're right there in the same room with you. Wild stuff, right? <laughs> but no, seriously, this uh, is very unusual as televisions go. It's an NEC Multisync V463 and if you're much of a computer person, you probably realize that name usually goes on NEC's computer monitors. Indeed, this is not actually a TV uh, per se, Although we are definitely watching TV on it right now. This is, um, where the heck's the remote? There we go, yeah. So we're watching local Seattle station 10-5, uh, which I guess is one of many uh, shopping networks we've got on the airwaves around here. And you'll notice this is 480i. Now this TV will receive 1080i signals. It displays them just fine. It's a, a native 1920 by 1080 panel. But I've picked this station specifically because I wanna show you something. You see the text here is kinda having some problems. Actually, maybe you can't see that. One moment. Let's just uh, make that a little easier. Uh, well, that's not gonna help. Got that pro-grade videography gear, buddy. Let's try that again. All right, there we go. Supposedly, this is getting you a nice close-up now. So you can see that uh, the letters are having some trouble. Well, watch this. Let's uh, get the remote here, jump into the OSD, and I'm gonna go over here and turn off deinterlacing. There we go. And uh, now hopefully you can see that the letters are having very different problems. <laughs> uh, if you're not familiar with uh, the concept of deinterlacing, uh, standard definition television signals as well as uh, HD 1080i signals uh, come to your TV as uh, two separate fields of data. It's every uh, even line and then every odd line, one after another. And there's not a lot of agreement on exactly how you should turn that into uh, a full screen image. On conventional CRT televisions back in the day, they just natively worked that way. And thanks to phosphor persistence and human persistence of vision, uh, it wasn't really a big problem. On LCD displays, which are intrinsically progressive, it's a much bigger problem. This is not the topic of the video, I'm just demonstrating that this is something you probably never realized was going on with your consumer television. I, I would say that the overwhelming majority of consumers have no idea what interlacing is and they don't care because consumer TVs just have this solved already. I, I don't know what they all do. Maybe some of them do bob, maybe some do weave, maybe they use a hybrid. It doesn't matter because they all look fine. They look the way you expect and uh, consumers generally aren't too picky about how their <laughs> local standard definition stations look on their huge HD television anyway. So this just really isn't a thing uh, that anybody would bother giving the user a setting for. But of course, this TV isn't for consumers at all. And in fact, this isn't even a television. I know I've said that several times, but I need to harp on it, okay? Let me show you the menu in this thing again, okay? This is the OSD where you set up all your, your various options for the TV itself. And then this is the control for the TV tuner. And then if I press the main menu again, it comes up over that. If you look very closely, you can see one disappears, but right before that, the other one is overlapped on it for a moment. And that's because the actual TV tuning is being done by this guy, which is a totally separate independent module that just plugs into the side of the TV and feeds it a signal uh, that's already been decoded and turned into HDMI. This has no idea how to tune HD television. And this makes sense because this is a commercial display. In other words, this is something meant to be sold to businesses to use in public spaces. You don't put this in your home. You wouldn't want to anyway, because for this 46 inch edge lit LED display, this thing was like $2,500 at a time when an equivalent consumer set was like 700, <laughs> if not less. You would never buy this for yourself, but if you're a business, well, you'll have a whole lot of very special needs. So what you'd get this for is, uh, for instance, to put up in a hospital waiting room. You know, it sits there and shows you either um, what the waiting time might be if they're that advanced, but mostly it just runs a slideshow with information about what services the hospital offers and recommends that if you think you're having heart attack symptoms, you should probably go let a nurse know so they don't let you die there in the waiting room. But in that application, you need things that consumers would never need. For instance, uh, these TVs are meant to be left on 24 seven for years and years and years. So they've got more advanced cooling. They, uh, in some cases, claim to have LCD panels that are more resistant to burn in for obvious reasons, but it goes much, much, much further than that. I'll get into some of that. But the point is, 
in an awful lot of commercial applications, you have no interest in receiving local television. You're just going to have the TV sitting there playing a, a local feed of some kind off of a, an HDMI source or even off a, a USB driver or something like that. So why include the extra expense of a TV tuner? In fact, there's a whole galaxy of commercial displays that don't have tuners built in. But suppose you own a ton of these things, you're using them for various purposes, and one day you decide it would be nice to be able to use this as an actual television. Well, you can buy this module from NEC that plugs in and gives you that capability. Uh, it also gives you a USB port, you know, so you can plug in a USB drive and play, you know, a slideshow of JPEGs or uh, MP4 files or something like that. And it has an ethernet jack that's used for something called IPTV, which I know nothing about. I, I briefly Googled it. Apparently it's a thing in Europe. Uh, I guess it's just TV that's delivered over raw IP. That's all I know about it. But the point is that it's completely optional, but it is optional. It is something you can add. And typically you can't add stuff to a television of any kind. Even monitors don't usually have expansion slots, but this one does. And it's one of many commercial monitors that have these slots. And we'll come back to that later. I'm gonna talk about everything else about this TV. And then we'll come back and talk about Chekhov's slot here. Let's just uh, get another picture on the screen here. Don't want to just be staring at a black rectangle here the whole time. Oh, wait a minute. Don't we all do that anyway? Obviously this thing has an HDMI input, which I have not plugged in. I'm definitely prepared. I definitely thought about this video before I started shooting. There we go. I'll just, uh, I'll just leave that there. That, that picture's good enough. So just to uh, pick a couple other applications for commercial displays like this, uh, menu boards. If you go to McDonald's and you know you get up to the cashier and you haven't really figured out what you want and you're looking at the menu and it keeps changing to other menus with stuff you don't want, and so you're standing there and they're staring at you and you're holding up the line because for some reason they didn't need to do this for 20 years, but now they do. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what you get one of these for because they're better engineered to handle high heat environments, low maintenance environments, that sort of thing. And then another example is video walls. If you go to like an airport and they've got, you know, a, a big uh, thoroughfare that's got like a huge display made out of like uh, an eight by eight grid of 42 inch TVs or whatever, that's made out of TVs like this. Uh, they're engineered for that sort of thing, kind of from top to bottom. I'll, I'll show you a few different features uh, for that. But uh, for instance, these bezels, these actually come off. I can't really demo this because I'd have to take all the screws out on top, but you can actually snap all the plastic off the TV to make the bezels thinner. Also, you'll notice that there's no buttons on the front and there's also none on the sides because, well, one, you're gonna butt these things up against each other. And two, once you take off the bezel, there'd be nowhere to put the buttons. So the buttons are all here on the back specifically for that purpose. Uh, likewise, there's no speakers on the bottom. There are speakers, but they're the worst I've ever heard in my life. These guys here and here. You know what, let me, uh, let me see if I can actually make some sound with those because I, I can't even express to you how much these things suck. I actually have two of these TVs and they both have the worst speakers I've heard in my life. I'm actually just going to play the, the last video I shot in here because that won't get content ID'd. Yes, it works. Uh, this thing, yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's coming across, but has been back to life. it is unbelievably tinny and miserable. <laughs> And I think the reason for that is uh, you really aren't expected to use the built-in speakers for any purpose. In fact, uh, you absolutely don't need to because uh, if you look on the side here, there's actually speaker terminals. This thing has a built-in like, uh, I, I think it's like a 10 watt amplifier or something like that. It's not a ton, but it makes a lot of sense because if you are putting this thing up in some public venue, if you want people to be able to hear it, you're probably gonna hang up a pair of outdoor speakers, like commercial speakers on those little rotating you know, wall mounts. And you, know, you don't wanna have to get a separate amplifier for the TV, right? And you're gonna have to find a separate place to mount it and you're gonna have to find an outlet for it and whatnot. Ah. I mean, most consumers aren't gonna care about this because assuming you aren't happy with the sound of the built-in speakers or a sound bar, which most people are, then you're probably willing to make some space for an amplifier, you know, figure out how you're gonna work your living room around that. But you know, a business that needs to install 25 or, or 50 or 2000 of these things in all sorts of different buildings all across the country or across multiple countries, they can't predict what they'll have room for. And every extra step, every extra piece of equipment is a whole extra level of hassle they have to go through. And so they're willing to pay extra for every single TV in order to have this built in. Now, of course you go, well, what about all the businesses that are paying extra for these TVs who don't need that feature? 
Well, that's sort of the story of this whole thing. You're paying a premium to get this incredible package of capabilities, which most businesses won't need, but everything is in there that you could possibly ask for, which is why if we look at the menu, this thing is absolutely jam packed with capabilities. There's all sorts of stuff in here that you will never find in a consumer television. An example of that was the deinterlace setting. I don't think I've ever seen this in a consumer TV. Maybe if you like dig really deep into the settings on one of those LG OLEDs or something like that, maybe that's in there, but I've never seen it. And then uh, there's other stuff on here like uh, the input detection algorithm is adjustable. You've got four different options for how to detect inputs. <laughs> Who the hell needs that, right? If you're using this thing at home and you turn it on and it's on the wrong input, you just press the button to switch to the right input. Well, in a commercial application, you don't have time to dick around with that, right? You need these things to turn on when the breaker gets flipped in the morning and be on the right input immediately because, well, there's a good chance if you're a restaurant or a hospital that you don't have anybody around who even has the time to learn how to fix these things when they're broke. Does anybody even know where the remote is? Do they know which button to press? Are they too busy to actually press that button? <laughs> the answers are no, no, and yes. I'm putting a really fine point on this, I know, but it's because an awful lot of people don't realize those limitations, that a lot of stuff like this gets installed and then the technician leaves and then nobody who actually interacts with it has any idea how to do the most basic things. And that's the reality that products like this have to be designed towards. Uh, another example of that, if we go into the menu here, there is a schedule section and you can actually give this thing like a complicated day by day schedule of when it should turn itself on and off. Again, because you don't have time for an employee to remember to do it every day. And if they forget to do it, then the TV just sits there off the whole time. Just, just have it do it itself, right? Silly thing to put in a consumer television, but mandatory for something like this. Let me just uh, switch inputs here. I'll show you another thing you're not likely to find in most American televisions, certainly, uh, that might actually make this thing interesting to some people watching. You might wanna actually go out and get one of these because uh, I've switched to the composite video input and if we go down here to color system, this will do NTSC and PAL and CCAM and 4.43 NTSC and PAL-60. So these are all standard definition television standards, but uh, the ones that people mostly talk about online are uh, NTSC and PAL. CCAM occasionally comes up, but it was only used in a few countries. I think it was, oh gosh, what was it, France? and then I, I think some various Eastern European states. But then these ones down here, hardly anybody ever talks about those. 4.43 NTSC, I think that's uh, uh, NTSC that's been adjusted to work in like South America off 50 Hertz, something like that. And then PAL 60 is the opposite. It's the PAL standard, but it's designed to run off of 60 Hertz, uh, which I think allows it to no, I can't remember what the hell PAL 60 is for. The point is, these are really weird standards that, as far as I know, the overwhelming majority of televisions that you can buy in this country don't support, but this does it all. Now, part of that, I'm sure, is just because these were being sold all over the world and they just had one model they sold everywhere. But also, uh, if for some reason, you know, you're a business and you need to hook up some piece of equipment that got imported from somewhere and never had a, a US specific model, you know, a VCR or a DVD player or something like that, then this thing is compatible with anything you might plug into it. And that's a cool feature that almost nobody needs, but if you do need it, you'll be glad it's there. So if I haven't made my point yet, this thing radiates professionalism and what nerd doesn't love that? We wanna fill our homes only with the stuff the pros use because the pros get the cream of the crop. They get the best parts and they don't get loaded down with bullshit. Look at this OSD, it's beautiful, right? It's so simple, it's so to the point. It's just text, minimal controls, it's incredibly readable. Um, when you go into the picture settings, I just remembered this, there's a carbon footprint indicator. And as you turn it down, it gets increasingly positive about saving the environment. So, okay, there's a little bit of bullshit in there. Not that I disagree with saving the environment, just that's such a corny way to do it. Um, but the point is, yeah, you're, you're allowed to see everything and it's all just very plain and straightforward. There aren't seven levels of advanced, really advanced, you know. Uh, everything's just right there for you to use. And this is what we all want, right? 
But the question is, do you actually need most of the extra features? And well, the answer is probably no, to be honest. Uh, for instance, let's, let's go take a look at the PIP feature. I mean, every TV has picture in picture these days, right? But this one, this one has some features yours probably doesn't. Let me get the TV tuner back. Fun fact, you're not supposed to plug these in while it's running. Also fun fact, I've tested, it doesn't hurt anything. TV blows up, pop, fizz. Okay, good, I didn't fry it. All right, now let's turn on the PIP and set our input here over to the PC. Oh, I, I guess it's been customized so that it only selects through three inputs. So let's uh, go in and change that. Oh, here's another thing that's, that's very business specific. Keep PIP mode. If you turn this on, then if you shut the TV off and turn it back on, the PIP will still be on. And that's because, well, if you're using the PIP at all, then you always want it there. So you don't wanna have to turn the TV on, then press the button every single day, right? All right, where are our inputs? That's odd, this is not letting me pick that input. <laughs> you know what? I may have just stumbled on something this won't do. I hadn't tried the PIP up until now actually, and uh, I don't think it'll tune uh, to two HD signals at once. It says it'll put the DisplayPort input down there though. Do I have something with that? Okay, let's see if this will reach. Oh, I think it will. There we go. Uh, little inconvenient, but we'll make it work. All right, so that's two streams from the same computer. Let's uh, switch this back to the TV on the main input. There we go, that's much better. Now, uh, the reason I uh, was doing this though, wasn't to show you the PIP, you know what a PIP is. I wanted to show you the POP. PIP mode, POP. I have no idea what a POP is, by the way. I Googled this, I could not figure out what it is. It means picture out picture. What is that gonna be? Oh, <laughs> okay. I admit, of all the things it could have been, that's not what I was expecting. Uh, uh, so it just sort of <laughs> just leaves that empty. Sure, why not? Um, the other ones, though, those make a little more sense. You can do side by side. They call this picture by picture. And if we select this one, oh, that's great. <laughs> I don't know what the application is for this, but you can do it if you want. <laughs> I have no idea what to say about this. I had prepared no notes. Uh, now, another feature that's buried in here is called the text ticker. I have no idea how this works. I'm gonna turn it on. Let's see what it does. Oh, oh, excellent. So the manual had no information on how the text ticker feature worked. It said that it was there. So you know when you're in a waiting room or something and you've got a, you know, well, just like this, basically. You've got a like a local TV station playing, but then at the bottom, there's scrolling text advising you of, information. Well, that's what this feature is for, but the manual didn't say where the text ticker comes from. So I'm like, um, it seems like an odd thing to not document, but I have the strong feeling that they probably assumed anybody using this would have a service relationship with them. So if there was anything they didn't know, they could just call their rep and they'd explain it. So the manual is missing a lot of information, okay? But now what I see is that the text ticker is just another way of doing the PIP. You saw that it shut off the normal PIP when I turned it on. I'm pretty sure that what we're seeing is just the cut off top edge of the screen. Let me uh, get my keyboard here. Let's see if that's true. Move the mouse over. Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah, the mouse is not distorted. So this isn't being compressed into that space. It's just showing you uh, the top edge of the display. So all you have to do is write a, a piece of software that just scrolls text at the top of the screen and bam, um, you're good to go. I have to admit, I really, I didn't, I didn't know what to expect, but I didn't expect that. And it looks like it actually makes it partially transparent, which, well, obviously that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it looks like you can move it up without decropping it. So you can put this in the middle of the screen if you want. We can have it crop the image less or more, and we can make it more or less transparent. Oh, and then detect. No idea what that does. Oh, and so there's a, a fade in option here. I did read about this in the manual. I believe if we go back and turn this off and then back on, ah, uh, I guess that doesn't work when you do it this way. Well, basically, I think there's supposed to be a way to turn the uh, text ticker on and off where it fades in, you roll a message, and then it fades out again. Uh, but again, the manual didn't say. Uh, now, what I have noticed is that you can also put this in vertical mode, uh, so you can have a, a vertically scrolling ticker as well. So, is this a feature that any of us has a use for? Probably not, but isn't it neat to know that it would be that easy if you wanted to do that? Just get one of these TVs. <laughs> Easier said than done, actually. <laughs> we'll get to that later. 
All right, let me uh, get this DisplayPort cable out of here before I trip and break my neck or, you know, knock the TV over, which would be a much greater tragedy. So I, I can't even begin to explain all the software features this thing has. We'll touch on a few more, but um, we should probably take a look at some of the uh, physical properties first, because there's a few things here that you really need to know about. Let's bring our second camera back, because there's no way to get this camera in there so you can see underneath. As far as inputs go, it's not too terribly exotic, but there's some strange things. Uh, for instance, I mentioned DisplayPort. I don't think I've ever seen that on a consumer television. It's probably out there somewhere, but it's, it's pretty rare, right? What's rarer is to see HDMI, but only one of them. I mean, how often do you see that? Uh, well, this TV makes up for it by having not just one, but two DVIs. And that's because it has in and out. I'll explain why in a moment, it's pretty weird. Next up, we've got a VGA port, but not just a VGA port. It's also labeled DVD slash HD slash video two. And that's because uh, here's a pinout for that port. This will accept VGA and component, which they're referring to here as DVD. And then of course, uh, if it's a 1080i component, it's HD. They're, they're just using that as an abbreviation. I don't know why, it's a very weird behavior. Uh, and then video two is a second composite input. The, the primary composite is of course this uh, BNC connector here. So I guess you could buy a whole bunch of different adapters from NEC to feed various signals into this. So it's quite versatile, but they also haven't put all those ports on there individually so they don't waste a whole bunch of space. This thing is actually fairly compact as things go, it's an edge lit LCD, so uh, it could be thinner except for all this stuff back here. But if they just, you know, ladled on the ports, then it would be a whole lot bigger and uh, not really worth the extra space since most people wouldn't need that even in a business setting. So it all makes sense. Uh, and then of course, uh, over here, we've got the buttons. Like I said, all the controls are on the back. Uh, and then we've got these. We've got two serial ports and an ethernet port because Absolutely everything on this TV can be controlled remotely. Every setting, every feature, you can turn it on, you can turn it off, you can turn the PIP on, you can set the inputs, you can adjust the brightness and color. Literally everything can be done with RS-232. And the reason that there's two ports is because you can daisy chain them. If you do have these set up in a video wall, and this supports uh, video walls of up to 10 by 10, so 100 TVs in one array, you can just daisy chain the serial signal from your PC into the first one, then into the next, and the next, and the next, and the next, and each one will repeat it until it gets all the way to the end, so you don't have to run 100 separate control cables. Now, the Ethernet, unfortunately, does not have that, and <laughs> that's kind of a bummer, because running 100 Ethernet cables up to your video wall sounds pretty miserable, but I get the impression that maybe you can't do everything over the Ethernet. I think you're expected to use the serial port for most of it, and then the IP interface is mostly for uh, SNMP. You can actually uh, monitor the temperature of this thing and uh, several other things about its health status remotely, and it can email you if something goes wrong. If this TV overheats and shuts off, it'll actually pop an alert email. How wild is that? But speaking of remote control, uh, there's a few other interesting things going on as far as that goes. Uh, for instance, here on the side, above the amplifier outputs, we've got uh, 3.5 millimeter jacks uh, for audio in and out. Nothing too wild there. But then above that, there's another 3.5 that's labeled remote in. And I admit I'm not 100% sure what's going on there because the manual mentions nothing about it. I wasn't able to Google anything. Nothing came up. There's one page that just says that that's where you can connect a wired remote. One possibility is uh, that you might have wanted to use this in an environment where IR remotes wouldn't work. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if interference is a thing with those, but maybe you've got it behind some glass that blocks IR, or you've got some sort of like wooden trim around the outside that also hides the IR receiver. You could probably plug in uh, like a photodiode in there and put it somewhere that the remote can get to. So someone would just have to know that if they wanna turn the TV on, they have to point over here. <laughs> Speaking of turning the TV on though, my favorite feature about this, and I wish that every TV remote was like this, it has two power buttons. And that's because one only turns the TV on. If I press it, nothing happens because the TV's on. You're already figuring out why this is, right? The other one turns it off and that's all it does. It only turns it off. Why? Because you come in in the morning, the video wall powered up, but something went wrong. Two out of your 25 TVs aren't on. Well, if you take your normal remote with the toggle button and point it at them and hit the button, 
Now 23 of them are gonna shut off and the other two come on and now you're playing lights out and you can't win, right? Well with this, if you hit power on, any that are off come on, the rest stay the way they are, get it? Makes a lot of sense, right? Well, if that's not granular enough, you have other options. You can customize the remote codes on these. There's an ID header in them, which you can set from the remote. You punch in some code here and you can address up to 100 TVs individually or in groups. If you take uh, your 25 TVs and you set the top four to group one, then group two, group three, group four, then you could turn on and off a whole strip of TVs at once or whatever else you wanna do. And those codes also work over the serial interface. So if you have 100 TVs, you don't have to send 100 commands. You can hit them all at once. And then since we're talking about video walls, uh, there's a feature in here that, again, I've not tried yet. I'm really hoping it works exactly <laughs> as it's described. Uh, we come in here to, well, they call it multi-display here, but they later renamed it to tile matrix. Oh no, there we go, it's, it's got the option, tile matrix. And there's tons and tons and tons of settings in here. In fact, I think tile matrix is a submenu. Here we go. You can actually tell the TV where it is in the video wall. So you tell it, okay, our wall is four monitors wide, four monitors high, and then I am monitor number four, and you can see it's illuminated that one. So we tell it which part of the signal it's getting. And then I believe we do that, and there we go. It actually slices out that portion of the image internally. So you don't, uh, sorry, I should probably explain this a little bit. Typically in a video wall scenario, you have a video wall processor. So you would take a, well, hopefully a 4K image, though in the old days it was 1080 and before that it was 480. Uh, you'd take a, a high resolution image, you feed it into this thing, and then the processor has you know 25 or 100 outputs and each one feeds to a different TV. Well, obviously there's downsides with this. You have to run 25 or 100 cables up to your TVs. You gotta get them all in the right order and you have to buy a separate piece of equipment. These guys not only can do the processing themselves, you don't even need to run more than one cable. The purpose of the dual DVI ports is daisy chaining. You can run a DVI signal to TV one, then loop it to the next and so on, all the way to the end of the video wall. So one DVI cable, one serial cable, and your entire video wall is wired up for data. You still have to run 100 power cables, <laughs> what can you do? But still, that's pretty damn cool, right? Not that you have any use for it. <laughs> so let's talk about something that you might have a use for. Let me, uh, let me turn off the tile, uh, tile matrix here. Oh, uh, real quick, if we just adjust this, we can step through which portion of the image we're getting. And then if we uh, adjust this, we can have it get larger portions of it. Oh, and then what's tile comp? I have no idea what tile comp is. Excellent. Oh, you know what? It's um, tile compensation. I just remembered, I read about this. Uh, you can actually tell the TVs how thick their bezels are and calibrate in the amount that's being lost in between the sets. So if I have uh, four TVs in a square here, it's going to delete a little bit on that edge and that edge to make up for the part that would be visually lost here. So technically you're throwing away part of the image, but to the viewer, they see a more coherent total picture, if that makes any sense. If not, Google it, they got PDFs. Okay, let's, uh, let's get back over to the whole topic of the slot. I made a bunch of noise earlier about how the slot module design allows you to buy a TV without this unnecessary tuner feature in case you're one of the many companies that doesn't need that. I was kind of blowing smoke. I don't think that's the reason for it at all. There's a lot of companies that make commercial monitors that put tuners in them. I, I doubt it costs very much. But it does mean that you can swap out this uh, big old module here with something that does something else. Because you're not likely to be using all these inputs at once. And in particular, if you're using the tuner, that's probably all you're using. But if you're doing something else, you're probably never gonna need a tuner. So why not swap it out with a completely different function? So for instance, NEC made another module that gives you HD SDI support. Not a terribly common need for this sort of thing, I think, but it's there if you want it. And an even less common need, I suspect, is the RTSP module. I don't know if I'll find a picture of this, but I swear I found one when I was looking a while back. It's literally, um, you plug an ethernet cable into it and then you send it an RTSP stream. So you could like have OBS transmit directly into a TV, right? But the reality is that the vast majority of businesses are probably using these things for static installations with just 
well, like I said, like digital sign displays on them. And for that purpose, you're pretty much always gonna use this sort of thing. Not necessarily this brand, although they are popular, but the market for little gadgets that drive digital signs is gigantic. There is so much diversity. You could get something to do pretty much anything you can imagine. And there are gobs and gobs of little boxes like this that do stuff as simple as just playing JPEGs off of a USB drive or video files all the way up to well, like this thing uh, is actually sort of a, a little appliance-ized OBS, if you will. Uh, you can actually, for instance, plug in a USB drive with some files on it, you know, JPEGs, videos, whatever, and then you can plug in an HDMI feed from, let's say, a satellite box, and then you can have this thing display the HDMI input on the HDMI output while periodically overlaying images from the USB drive on it. Or, uh, in another model I have, it actually has a built-in TV tuner, and you can have it do the same thing with a live television feed. Then you can build schedules, so at different times of day it displays different stuff, or you could wire it up with complex scripting, so that, uh, for instance, uh, one person who, who administrates these things told me they actually use them for emergency messages. So they've got these hooked up to all the TVs in the building, and if there's like a fire or something like that, they can actually have these things mute the television and then scroll a message across the screen telling everyone what the emergency is. So you're already set to jet. If you're building a digital sign, you get the pick of the litter. The only problem is that, well, you've got a separate box now that you've got to figure out where to put. You got to hang it somewhere, either on the back of the TV or on a wall. Then you got to give it power. Then you got to run an HDMI cable to the TV. And what if you just don't have the room for it? In a lot of places just simply isn't enough space and, and not enough outlets. Um, it would be nice if it was just all one module. Well, so about that. The actual purpose of this slot is to install one of these. One of these little guys, if you will. I just can't hold all these lines. There's got to be a better way. Of course, there is. Uh, let me find a keyboard. You can probably hear this, but there's a fan just going bananas back there. Because, as I'm sure I don't need to explain any further, this is a full fat PC uh, that just plain old plugs into the television. Now let's take a look at some specs here because I have no idea what this thing is. All right, this TV is now equipped with a Core i5 third gen, 2.5 gig, uh, four gigs of memory. <laughs> For some reason it's running the 32-bit version of Windows Embedded, no idea why. Uh, and this was actually being used by a school. They had a piece of software on here called Octopus, which probably a bunch of people are watching it be like, oh, that thing, I know that thing. I bought this off eBay, so sorry for just <laughs> putting someone's data up on the screen here, but you should have wiped it, bud. So I'm gonna show you a little bit more about this later uh, because this is actually for a, a very different purpose than um, what I've been talking about up until this point. But uh, this piece of software, is for kids to do collaborative, like creative activities on. It really doesn't demonstrate very well on this TV. It'll, it'll make a lot more sense later, but well, it's, it's just a computer, it's, it's a PC, right? And um, as I've expressed many times in my videos, particularly the Little Guys series, which I don't think this will be in, but we'll see. Maybe, I'll, maybe I won't figure out anywhere else to put it. Uh, but a computer can do anything. <laughs> anything with a x86, or in this case, x64 processor, will do anything you like. Uh, you know, I guess I could probably just walk to the other room and grab a USB drive and just boot Linux up on this thing. I can't think of any reason not to do that. I'll be right back. All right, this is some copy of Fedora I found laying around on my hard drive. Let's uh, shut down here. You know, since this thing's shut off, I might as well show it to you before I fire it back up. If you've watched all of my videos, you might recognize this as an OPS module. OPS is the Open Pluggable Specification, and it's an Intel standard from I think it was 2011, so it's pretty old at this point, which is for exactly this purpose. Uh, it's meant to let you make a dumb TV smart or not do that if you don't want to or change the way that it's smart. If you didn't like this computer, you could swap it out for another one. And this was possible because the OPS spec is very basic. It doesn't really specify all that much beyond some thermal requirements, obviously, so you don't have a thing in the back of the TV that's gonna overheat it, right? You, you can't put like a <laughs> i7 quad core desktop processor in there, which is not to say that they don't make i7 modules. They actually do. I mean, as you saw, this one was an i5. The, the i7s aren't that much higher powered. Uh, and this actually does get a decent amount of juice from the TV. This port on the back here combines pretty much every interface that you might want for this application. You've got DVI, DisplayPort, USB 2 and 3, 
uh, serial and CEC, that's a, a consumer electronics control, it allows this device to control the TV or the TV to pass IR codes through to this device, I can't remember which. Then there's an audio interface and then just uh, a single voltage power rail between 12 and 19 volts. Uh, and these guys get quite a bit of amperage off of it. This one is rated at 12 volts, five amps. So that's like what, uh, 60 odd watts? I'm really bad with math. It's, uh, it's no gamer rig, but I mean, you could, you could probably game on it if you're not a coward. But obviously it's not intended for putting super high performance machines into your TV. It just doesn't really prevent that if you want to. Um, because the thing is that some of what these are used for is gonna be fairly taxing. You, you might be using this to run custom software that was developed uh, in house for, for your company that who knows, who knows what it'll do. It could do anything under the sun. Uh, and being limited to like an Atom processor or some ARM SOC or something like that uh, would make a lot of stuff just flat out impossible. But an i5 third gen is more than enough to do just about anything you can conceive of in this sort of application. I I'm gonna open this thing up very briefly and, and show you the inside here. There's not a lot to these things. Uh, you take out a few screws, the top cover comes off and then inside you've got a board with a CPU under a heatsink and not a whole lot else, just miscellaneous chips. Um, if we flip it over and take off the bottom panel, uh, you can get to the RAM, but I, I don't think there's any expansion interfaces in there because, well, you're not really supposed to do that, right? <laughs> the only thing you could uh, conceivably want to add to one of these would be more memory because they've already got everything else you need, video, uh, ethernet, audio. I mean, what are you gonna do, install a GeForce? Uh, and the hard drive is actually uh, on this little tray here. So you could put as big a drive as you like in there as long as it's SATA. I'm sure the newer ones support NVMe. So these things are incredibly simplistic, but they do also expose all their ports externally. So if you wanted to, uh, you could actually put more equipment back there and, and hook it up to this thing. Uh, you've got the USB ports, you've got the uh, separate HDMI output, uh, and some of them actually come with Wi-Fi. So virtually everything you could want to do uh, in this form factor is possible. Although there are companies that have gone above and beyond. Uh, let me grab one of my other modules here. There's a de facto extension to OPS. I don't know that it has a name and I don't think it's official, uh, but it makes the modules thicker. The outline is still the same, so you could take this module and put it in a slot for this one, but you couldn't do it the other way around. This won't fit into this TV. But the reason I have this one is because in addition to a whole load of USBs, which I think is just really funny, uh, it also has HDMI and VGA capture inputs. This thing actually has a capture card. And the reason for that is that these get used in uh, teleconferencing systems where you need the ability to ingest a video signal to send to the person at the other end of the call. So uh, that's what that's for. And it's both HDMI and VGA because the signal you're sending might be from a laptop, that sort of thing. So as you can see, there's a lot of different things that have been done with this standard. Uh, but in this case, we're nerds, so all we're gonna do is just mess around. So let's mess around. Nerds don't want all this professional grade stuff in order to do something with it. We just wanna waste time. Uh, where's delete on this horrible little keyboard? Or is it delete? Oh, it is. I'm not gonna do the whole little guy's deep dive on the BIOS. It's a BIOS. It works pretty much like all the BIOSes. And here we go. Yep, we got USB boot. There we go. No. Why is that the, why is that the top option on this page? Joker's trick. Okay, looks like we're booting, which isn't surprising. This is like a, a Fedora 35, I think it's like two or three years old. Uh, I'm sure it'll run just fine on here. It's really funny though, seeing the text that small, but that crisp, like I'm standing right here and oh, those pixels, they're so, they're so crunchy. Oh, there we go. Uh, what activities do we have? We have room for activities, but what activities are there? I have no idea what's on the Fedora live disc. You got any games on your TV? No, doesn't look that way. Ah, uh, here, one moment. We're networked. Let's see if we can get Tux Racer on this thing. Oh man, did they shut down the, the repos for this already? Boy, that seems really likely. Hmm, well that seems slower than it should be. The hell's going on here? Nothing's working. Oh, I don't think this thing likes working in, in only uh, uh, four gigs of RAM, I've just realized because it's actually uh, only got 113 megs left. So, uh, well, let's just upgrade it then. I've got RAMs, right? 
again, since this is a PC, we can just make it better. All right, what do we got in here? Oh, <laughs> I just discovered I lied earlier. This thing actually has an expansion slot. I, I probably put some text on the screen when I took it apart, but uh, it looks like mini PCI, or I, I should say mini PCIe. And that might be the variety that only has the USB lines wired up, and it's only re really useful for Wi-Fi or, or cellular radios. Uh, yeah, it looks like that's a DDR3-1600. I'm sure I've got something bigger. What's in the big guy, I wonder? <laughs> Four gigs DDR3. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> Who has RAM? You look like you have RAM. Four gigs DDR3. <laughs> Damn it. Oh my God, it's two four gig sticks. I can't win. My kingdom for an eight gig. I'm offering you a whole kingdom here, come on. Found some, had to get a laptop out of the trash. Oh, there we go. Will this fix our problem? Who knows? All right, here we go. Let's just cut to the chase. And now it's running a hell of a lot better, uh, but the store still doesn't work, so I had to install Tux Racer from the command line because that's the world we live in. Oh, that already looks like it's gonna run like a, like a hot damn. Oh yeah, there we go. This game from like 20 years ago runs like a dream on here. Wow, the sound effects are so much louder than the music by default. These deafening pops. Hooray! Hey, he's doing it too. Okay, okay, so I'm, I'm putting too fine a point on it again. The moral of the story is, you can do whatever you want on a personal computer. I could put haiku on here. I'm not gonna, but I could. So the point is, OPS, an incredibly cool concept. You know, it, it's, it's something really should have been built into every TV. Being able to turn a dumb TV into a smart TV or into a different type of smart TV is in itself awesome. And then for, for businesses, the idea of being able to swap out the PC if it dies or, or if you want to upgrade it or whatever, just like that, just pop, pop, done. Really cool, but we've still only seen part of what this is capable of. Uh, this is one of the applications, digital signage and well, whatever the hell this is. Uh, but the other, which I alluded to earlier, was digital whiteboards. And for that, we're gonna to need to scoot on over into the other room. All right, so. Welcome back to the studio. This is where I shoot my normal videos. Uh, the uh, set is over there, uh, my desk and the, the blue wall uh, and whatnot. And this is on the opposite side for probably obvious reasons. This is my program monitor. <laughs> it's kind of a big one. I think most people don't use a program monitor this large. You know, I, I need to be able to see where I am on the screen. I need to know if I'm too close to the side so I won't have room for on-screen graphics or you know, if I'm just not holding something up the right way, that sort of thing. You need to be able to see yourself. But, well, the set I used to have for this was like 55 inches and it worked fine. This one is 75 inches and 4K, both of which are totally unnecessary. But I didn't get this to be a good program monitor. This is just the only place I could put it that it fit. I got this TV because it has a number of very special features. I mean, hell, if nothing else, it's got a front panel HDMI input. You ever seen that? I've never seen that in my life. I mean, consumer TVs used to all have front panel composite inputs and even S-Video, uh, but that was back in the days when people were frequently like plugging their camcorder into their TV for 20 minutes and then unplugging it and putting it away. Nowadays, I think very few people have HDMI devices that they wanna plug in temporarily. Uh, it's usually a game console or something that you have plugged in all the time. So I understand why they stopped doing that. I'm still mad about it. But obviously I wouldn't have driven across town and given somebody on Facebook Marketplace $300 for this thing just for that. And in fact, it's even a worse deal than it seems because it didn't come with a remote control. This always sucks. You get a TV used, it doesn't come with the remote. You try to look it up and all the remote numbers are like this long and you can't figure out which one works with your set. So in this case, it's great because I don't actually need to get the remote. The entire interface is touch-based. This is a 10-point touchscreen and the menus, the input selection, all of it can all be done without the remote. Pretty cool, but why? <laughs> because, as I was saying earlier, this is actually for doing the other thing that OPS is used for. This is a digital whiteboard. 
Let me show you what that means by pulling this out and hopefully not ripping it off the wall. There we go, crisis averted. Uh, it's kind of hard to get in here. Ooh. Uh, there we go. So this is the largest TV I've ever had the pleasure of owning. And honestly, even compared to a consumer 75 inch, this thing is a beast. I think it's something over 200 pounds, I wanna say. And there's not a single stand on the market that is officially rated to support this. And I'm not even counting wall mounts. I'm saying no stand anywhere is rated for this much weight. Like I think this exceeds plasma TVs, which used to be the gold standard for incredibly heavy flat screens. So this thing is monstrous. I actually literally could not find a wall mount that would support it anywhere. But then I just happened to go into RePC, our local eWay store, and they had this absolute unit. This thing is rated for like 400 pounds. It is a tank. And even then, even with the gigantic spreader bar on here, the Visa pattern on this TV was still too big for it. So uh, if you look closely, by which I mean if I move the camera, I actually had to go to Home Depot and buy these galvanized steel channels uh, drill new holes in them, and then uh, assemble a bigger spreader bar to adapt this out to this TV. And I am incredibly lucky that this has not fallen off the wall, but I think at this point, if it hasn't, it's not going to. <laughs> so why did I put in all this effort? What made this thing worth it? Well, it has a number of interesting features. So in addition to the multiple HDMI inputs, plus the one on the front, it also has an HDMI output. And here's the purpose of that. These things are meant to be used in conference rooms where people often do teleconferencing, at least in theory, and in classrooms where they often do remote learning, where uh, the class is broadcast online for students who can't attend in person. And the HDMI output is useful because it replicates whatever's on the screen. So whatever input you pick, or, or even I think if it's the internally generated uh, menu and media player, uh, it gets output through the HDMI port here and it can even be downscaled from 4K to 1080 or I think 720, and you then feed that into a dedicated streaming device, which is a big thing at schools. So they'll just have uh, dedicated appliances where you just plug in an input and hit go, and everything is pre-configured by some uh, third party so that the teachers don't need to know how to run the damn things or, or do any diagnostics or anything. So rather than try and split the input signal that's going into the TV, which is of course impossible if it's internally generated in the TV anyway. And rather than having to worry about uh, having a, a, a scaler that the teacher has to know whether to use or not use, everything that appears on the panel just gets coerced to whatever resolution you want and spit out, and that makes it really, really easy. And the same is true for teleconferencing setups. If you're uh, using one of those like Cisco or Polycom multi-camera conference room rigs, they usually have video capture inputs that you can plug in a laptop or something like that. If you just plug this thing in instead, then bam, you're, you're good to go. Uh, and this is particularly important if you're using the remaining feature this has, which is the OPS slot, for which this company commissioned, uh, or built, I guess, uh, special dedicated devices. As you can see from the name, Active Connect goes with the active panel. This looks superficially just like the other ones, uh, except for, well, it's got a, a, a USB-B port for some reason. I'm not even sure what that's for. Uh, it's got a mi micro SD slot, you know, whatever. Uh, it has an HDMI input, so it's it's much like the, the OPS module I showed you that had the, the capture card built in. This one does as well. Uh, and of course, it's got Wi-Fi, but I, I mentioned that was a thing with these. So this doesn't look too exotic, but what makes this special is entirely on the inside. Instead of x86, this thing has an ARM processor, and I'll show you where that is as soon as I can get out of here. <coughs> Sucks. Ooh. All right, don't fall off the wall. Don't fall off the wall, please. Thank you. All right, let's get down to aluminum tacks here. So. What I've shown you so far is not what this thing is really intended for. You can do what I'm doing here. You can plug it into any HDMI source. Uh, and in fact, I, I mentioned it's a, a multi-point touchscreen. If I were to run a USB cable over to my PC, I could actually use this as a touch input to Windows. But none of that is what it's for. Let's uh, go to the source input here and pick OPS. That'll automatically turn it on. I love that it actually gives you this little internal message saying, hang on, hang on, the module's starting. 
I just know Promethean is gonna email me, hey, do you wanna do an ad? No, I don't wanna do an ad. This is not an ad for Promethean. I got this TV from somebody who absolutely took it out of the trash at work, and uh, I got all these OPS modules off eBay, and I am not interested in promoting anybody. I have no idea if Promethean's product is any good. Also, this is a huge industry with tons and tons of competition, and I'm sure that uh, there's 50 or 60 other companies do pretty much the same thing, probably pretty much the same way. All right. So here it is, this is the software, and already you're probably getting some vibes. You're probably getting some vibes. Uh, let's just increase the vibes. Yeah, it's, it's already obvious, right? Let's make it more obvious. Uh, boop. Are you getting it yet? Are you getting it? It's Android, but we knew that. It's literally just uh, <laughs> ordinary Android. Uh, go to about device here, version 6.0. Patch level 2018. I have no idea when this thing was sold, but I can tell you that the kernel version says it's from 2020. So this is a really common thing in low-end Android devices. Like if you buy uh, an Android tablet off of AliExpress, there's a very good chance it's gonna be like Android 8 patch level 2023, because Google has really long tail support for these things. Uh, but a lot of the time you'll find out that the kernel is far more recent like we have here. Now, don't quote me on this at all. I'm not an Android expert, but I'm pretty sure that the dash dirty and the test dash keys means that they actually shipped this thing with like a developer mode version of the OS on it that probably doesn't do like app signing verification or anything like that. Another very common thing with low end Android devices. Don't quote me on any of that though, that, that could all be bullshit. But the point is, yeah, it's just an ancient copy of Android running on presumably a very slow processor. I, I, I didn't see the hardware type in there, but you can imagine that's what it is. What if you look in the developer options, does that say, and naturally, of course, they don't have the developer options disabled because this is a developer version of the OS, I'm pretty sure. Oh, let's turn on the uh, screen overlay. There we go. There's the multi-touch for you, if you were curious. Wow, that draws really slowly. <laughs> I don't know what the processor in this thing is, but it's probably no Snapdragon, tell you that. And of course, uh, I'm sure there's no Google Play Store on here. Oh, wait. Oh gosh, <laughs> there is. Uh, is this logged in? Wait, hang on. Did I log into this? Oh my God, whoever owned this previously left themselves logged in when they sold it. Well, okay, that's not my problem. Well, shit, now we've got to install something. Let's play a game. What's simple? What can we manage on this uh, enormous screen? I wonder if they have Tux Racer on here. I feel like Vanna White using this thing. Um, keep Keyboard? Sir, the keyboard's like stuck down below this bar here and I, oh wait, here we go. Ah, there we are. Something tells me they didn't test this too thoroughly. Um, is, there, is there a space bar down here? Oh, there we go. Oh, okay, it's just sort of floating. It's not attached to the bottom of the screen. Super Tux cart, excellent. Oh, this is gonna be so unplayable. The hardware in here is probably not gonna handle the 3D very well, uh, and it's also gonna be impossible to control. I can't wait. If you're wondering if the notifications drawer is there, it is. You gotta sort of grab up here. There it is, a sort of off-center. And as you can see, it, um, <laughs> it has some problems. Uh, but so do I. What else is new? All right, we're installing. Place your bets. Do you think this is gonna work at all? I really don't. I mean, it's gonna run, but it's gonna be unplayable. All right, here we go. Oh my God, finished installing, time to install. Absolutely loving that Android 4 era UI. Okay, here we go, let's get rid of the nav bar at the bottom there. I was standing here for a moment going, oh, what kind of controls are we gonna use? And I realized this thing probably does not have an accelerometer or a gyroscope. <laughs> The menu is running better than I expected. Oh, okay. I, I, maybe this game is not as graphically intense as I thought it was. I wonder what any of these maps are based on. It's, it's not like this is a, a Nintendo game and, and they actually have like a rich portfolio of uh, video game history to draw from. Oh, wow, that, that actually looks reasonable. Oh, I gotta get over here. It says uh, it's got auto acceleration, so we should be good. Oh, look at that. Okay, I, I really didn't expect it to run this well. I'm, I'm actually kind of astonished. Oh man, I can't believe this is actually working. Uh, well, I mean, working is a very strong statement. I absolutely cannot get to the weapons over there. <laughs> the 
I would need a second person. I'd need a gunner. Oh no! My finger keeps slipping off the wheel. And when that happens, you immediately stop accelerating. Um, the other fun thing that happens is if you re-grab the wheel over here, then I, I think you go into reverse. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's not playing very well on this screen, let me tell you. But it's running a hell of a lot better than I think anybody could have expected. So <laughs> if you had any doubts, it's just Android, all right? How do, we, how do we get out of here? Do we drag up? Oh, there's a little button there. There we go. But with all that nonsense out of the way, let's look at some of the things this was actually intended to do. Uh, so you'd think these would be sort of the flagship apps, but they don't seem to be. They're just shortcuts to various websites. This is the gallery tool. Uh, this is just Opera itself. Um, what does this do? Can't connect to the camera. Well, what do you expect? Oh, well, I guess actually, I guess you probably could stick a camera on top and plug it into the USB. Uh, because again, if you're using this for teleconferencing stuff, that might be useful. Uh, also, this here is a screen share app. Uh, and I believe what you'd do with this is you'd run their app on like your Windows or Mac laptop, and then it would just cast the screen directly to uh, the software here. Now, obviously, I think Apple has a solution for this and Windows has its own solution for this and neither one of them can be easily supported uh, by devices like this without paying an enormous amount of money to Apple or supporting a broken, miserable protocol that nobody cares about from Microsoft. Uh, so this is just uh, one that they cooked up themselves. It's probably VNC under the hood or something like that. It's absolutely the right solution versus telling a teacher, well, you should just have a different brand of laptop. But other than that, these are not terribly interesting. The real juice is in this little menu here. Uh, and this program, I think, is the obvious draw. I <laughs> Draw, it's a whiteboard app. Do you get it? <laughs> Didn't even write that. I wrote that though. Congratulations, this is everything you'd actually see one of these used for. What I've heard about this whole category of product is that it's all based on these silly ideas of how school actually works. Even in like the most suburban, you know, American environment, kids are not going to engage with this sort of thing. This, this feels so pandering to me, but we just wipe that. Now, I assume that this is why the TV has this metal rail down here, because this looks exactly like where you'd put a piece of chalk on a chalkboard or a dry erase marker on a whiteboard. And I assume that they had some uh, uh, stylus, styli, styluses uh, for this thing that looked like that, but were capacitive, right? Seems, seems like a pretty obvious idea. Although, I mean, since it is multi-touch, I don't know that you'd need them. Um, it's pretty basic stuff, you know, it's, it's, it's a drawing program for kids, right? So beyond the most basic, you know, multiple colors and, and that sort of thing, it also has a highlighter tool. I, I can imagine a teacher using the heck out of that. Uh, you can set the background to a grid. It's actually kind of neat. Uh, you can set it to these things, which I, I assume are for handwriting practice, right? Like I've got to assume it's, it's for, doing, for doing that, right? I think you can drop in images, right? Oh, oh, I completely forgot about this. So yes, you can insert arbitrary images. So you can like plug in a flash drive and, and load a picture off of it. Or they've got all this stuff on here that you can just inject uh, and then put it wherever you need it. Uh, and then I, I suppose you could, you know, write teacher stuff. I could picture teachers using this maybe, <laughs> maybe. Uh, although I think most wouldn't bother and that's what I've heard that it's very hard to get any of the staff or kids to interact with these things. They mostly just get installed, uh, sit there for years, then get uninstalled and replaced with the same thing from another company for another contract, but whatever. And obviously they expected that kids might use it because it has a multi-user mode where uh, depending on, on which side you're on, it uses a different color and gives you your own little uh, uh, toolbar here. Oh, I almost forgot. There's also some drawing tools. So for instance, we can get Oh gosh, Protractor? I barely went to school. I don't know what things are called. It's kind of awkward to interact with. Like you can definitely use it to, to measure angles. Oh, 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 that's what it's for. I thought it was for drawing lines. It's for drawing regions. Uh, let's see how this guy works. Do we just, um, do, we do, the, do we do the same thing? Does this do lines? It doesn't seem to do anything. No, there's lines there. Yeah, yeah, sure enough. 
there's lines, so you can use this. That's, that's actually kind of cool now that I see it. And then what, does that uh, just erase everything that we added on this side? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting, just like layers here. Um, the stuff that I wrote before I went into multi-user mode, that stayed there, uh, but this just erased everything uh, that I wrote since I went into that mode. So I guess as the teacher, you could prep the board with something, then go to multi-user mode, and then the kids could write on top of it, and then you could just undo it when you're done. So it's like, okay, that, that all seems pretty reasonable, right? And I don't know why, but this does seem to make more sense as an Android app. I mean, it doesn't have to be, certainly. Let me just, um, let me make that point. I'll be right back. Remember this guy? OPS is standard, so of course, he'll work here too. You're not supposed to yank these out when it's running, but it's safe. I've done it enough times. Oh, you know what? I left Linux in there. Well, let's just see what that looks like. Hmm, no signal. Why? This worked before. Oh, there we go. Huh, weird. Uh, I guess when you boot Linux on this, it does something that turns off the uh, DisplayPort interface going to the TV, uh, but Windows plays well with it, I guess. Um, buh? Oh, I, I guess this module was made in China and the recovery software, um, they never changed it to English. Why is it doing a recovery though? Maybe I broke it by yanking it out when it was running. Hmm, couldn't be. All right, there we go. <laughs> Took a little bit, but it uh, looks like it's working now. And we should be able to start Octopus here, sir. You know what, let me, uh, there we go. By the way, this uh, has the box light name on it and they didn't make Octopus, it's just been customized for them. Box light is the name of another manufacturer of digital whiteboard TVs for uh, very much the same purpose as you can kind of tell already from the style of the software. Uh, this too, uh, can I send this over there? Now this unfortunately <laughs> does not appear to let me move the toolbar to the right side uh, and I don't want to just be constantly over here all the time. So uh, the point is you can see this, this does the same thing, uh, but it's got a lot more tools. So for instance, it looks like, uh, oh, come on, every, every time I touch something, it tends to, to not take, but there we go. So we, we could draw shapes. Uh, what is this? Is this a highlighter? That's your highlighter. Let's you embed images. Uh, oh, oh, that's cute. It's got this little uh, uh, virtual uh, kind of flashlight mode. Really definitely radiating a schoolroom kind of atmosphere here. What is this? Uh, what? Oh, what does this even do? Is this, is this just for hiding part of the board, I guess? Yeah, hmm, seems that way. What else we got in here? Uh, capture tools, really? Huh, oh, I guess if we had a camera plugged in, then we could embed a uh, video in there. Oh, this lets us do a screen capture. What do we do like that? Um, where's it go? <laughs> oh, I, I, it probably goes into a gallery somewhere, okay. And then if we, oh, if we touch on, on things we've already drawn, they're vector objects, sort of, uh, so we could resize that. Is it a vector? I think it is, because the resolution here looks really low, yet when I resize this, it doesn't seem to be getting any more pixelated, so I, I think that actually is a vector. It looks like there's an on-screen keyboard, though I can't tell. Oh, there's a, there's a text tool. There it is. Oh, okay. It's got <laughs> this. Is, this is actually quite nice. This seems a lot nicer than the Promethean app. Again, I'm not promoting anybody. I don't know who the hell Boxlight is. I don't even know if they exist anymore. Uh, let's uh, let's just set that at something more reasonable. All right, here we go. Oh, this is a really strange layout. I have to admit, I'm doing better than I expected. Wow, that's like, what, three errors? It's actually not half bad. Can we make this small? Oh, we can. Oh, that's, that's probably a lot more manageable. Okay, I have to admit, I'm impressed. Octopus actually seems all right. I don't know why the resolution is so bad. I don't know if you can see this, but it's all super, super crunchy. Do we have any settings? Uh, doesn't look like there's much really going on in the settings. Maybe, there's probably some administrator app you've got to run, some buried thing that only technicians are supposed to know about uh, where you can set stuff like that. But you'd think it would be set correctly from the get-go. Now see, 
This is the Windows 8 experience, right? A touch-based UI. This, this is how it's supposed to work. Quizdom tools, anything going on in there, sir, sir? Oh, they're down there. Preferences, Calic does, email. Okay, nothing going on there. Oh, 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 okay. I guess Quizdom is a different piece of software then because this looks like some sort of results slash participants. Oh, well, the name does suggest that it's for quizzes. So maybe they had some sort of business where like kids would do quizzes on like tablets or something and then the results would be visible on the screen. View logs. Uh, yeah, we got a, a, an application called Answer Key. Love this logo, love this like free software ass graphic design. I mean, hell, who's ever gonna see it, right? Ooh, oh, that's that good Microsoft Office ribbon shit right there. Okay, this looks like, uh, this is how we set up a quiz using this thing. Uh, do we have any saved sessions? Doesn't look like there's any like samples. Ah, that's a bummer. I mean, you, you, you sort of get the idea of what this is for, right? You know, you'd build questions uh, with answers and points and then you'd hit start session uh, and then everybody would connect to it. You get your participant management here where you could do all your user enrollment and whatnot. Yeah, so I think this, this sort of explains itself. Now, I did see there was a folder called games. What do we think is going on there? You got any games on your whiteboard? Uh, we have baseball, fast track, mission to Mars, and quandary. Oh, and they're all shockwave flash objects. Can we just can we just open them in a browser? That'd be funny. It doesn't seem promising, if I'm honest. I kind of think this is supposed to run inside a larger program. Also, get a load of that Google Chrome. Wow, been a while since I saw that version of the UI. Those were different days. Back then, we were amazed at how fast it was. I think that's a non-starter, and I think we're sort of getting an idea of uh, what this thing is all about. Uh, and as you can see, yeah, you, you could do anything you wanted in this space, right? OPS could be anything. You know, this, this is running Windows. The other thing is running Android. I'm pretty sure somewhere out there, uh, there's uh, like the bright sign unit that I showed you earlier. I think they made an OPS version of that. Uh, and I've seen OPS versions of several other appliance devices. So yeah, pretty much anything you can imagine fitting into that form factor, I think has been fit into that form factor. Uh, and so in the end, we just have to ask, what does any of it mean for you? The takeaway here is that OPS is a fascinating technology with a lot of applications which at this point in time are probably no longer relevant to most people, even a lot of nerds watching this. Not to suggest that computers of this era aren't useful. I mean, an i5 third gen, and they make much newer ones in the OPS format, are still absolutely uh, cromulent for all sorts of applications. The trouble is, if you're in the market for this sort of weird thing, you probably have the money to just pick up something a lot more useful and a lot newer, and you probably don't care that it's not literally built into your TV. I mean, for like 50, 60 bucks, you can go buy like a Lenovo 1L machine, like a Think Center Tiny that has much better specs, much more expandability, isn't limited to this format, and isn't married to a TV that, well, at this point, if you find one, it's probably pretty outdated. The Promethean in the other room, okay, that thing's all right, at least it's 4K, but it's certainly not, you know, new. <laughs> I think it's from like 2018 or something like that. And while there are newer ones, they're not on the used market. Uh, so they're gonna run you like five to $8,000. Because that's the thing, all these things were fiendishly expensive new. The only reason that I have one, the only reason that I have three is because they're older ones that are getting cycled out and thrown away. Now. The flip side of this is the older ones are getting cycled out and thrown away. So if you keep an eagle eye out, you can probably get one in pretty much any major city and maybe some not so major ones. Because again, they're getting installed by businesses who are now closing offices that they don't need anymore uh, and getting rid of these stupid teleconferencing setups that nobody ever used. Also, of course, they're getting cycled out by businesses whose contract is running out with their current provider of useless teleconference stuff nobody is using. So they're signing up with a new provider who rips out the old stuff, installs new stuff nobody will ever use, and the old stuff just goes in the dumpster and then employees take it home and they flip it on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. That's how I got mine. That's how you should get yours. And as for the modules, you sort of have the pick of the litter there. Um, the higher end ones like the i7s and whatnot, those still go for quite a bit, unfortunately, uh, at least when I found them, but you can get lucky uh, because a lot of people have no idea what they have. Of course, that also means they're usually not labeled correctly. If you go to eBay and look up OPS module, 
or AliExpress, because there's a lot of them on there, you can get mid-range ones for between $40 and $80, uh, very reasonable prices. The higher-end ones are more like five and eight hundred and twelve hundred. dollars but if you take the model numbers and set some saved searches, you could probably get lucky from somebody who's just like, I don't know what this thing is, and throws it up there for 50 bucks. But that's really only useful for the tinkerers in the audience, because like I said, we just have better options now. You don't really need to do this. Uh, unfortunately, as much as it pains us nerds to hear it, smart TVs work pretty well. I, I know that makes people mad, but like, I, I see nerds like myself go out and buy a TV and strain as hard as they can and burst a blood vessel in their forehead trying to get one that's not smart, then they take it home and plug in a thing that plays Netflix. It's, it's the same thing. If you go out and just buy a smart TV, they run the apps that connect to Plex so you can watch your pirated anime. It's the same thing. <laughs> you don't even need to get a separate box. But even if you're gonna get a separate box, you can just get like, uh, what, the Android TV thing. Those work just fine. And that's what most people are doing in my experience. And so it really isn't getting you a whole lot other than being able to say, hey, my TV has a computer in it. And it's really kind of a shame because if everybody knew these existed 12 years ago, when the first round of them was being thrown in the dumpsters, then it would have been a lot more relevant back then. But I really think that ship has sailed. And, and frankly, the ship has probably kind of sailed on OPS in general. It was absolutely very relevant in 2011, 2015, uh, but with the plummeting cost of uh, SOCs and vendors uh, you know, supporting software in embedded devices for much longer than they used to and, and all sorts of other factors, it feels like the OPS as a concept is becoming irrelevant. Uh, and at the same time, Intel is trying to kill it. Uh, they have a new standard called SDM, by new, I mean it's like five years old, I think. It's the exact same concept, except it's a little bit smaller, it's got slightly newer interfaces, and it's licensed, it's not open. Um, I guess Intel got mad that all these Chinese companies were making these things and not paying them anything. Like, that can't be permitted. Uh, so now you have to pay them money for every single module, I think. And that means that uh, I have not found one that costs less than about $1,200. And I'm guessing that uh, for both that reason, you know, Intel ruining what they had, and the increasing popularity of devices with built-in appliance modules, uh, I think this is just going down the drain. Nowadays, a company that makes a digital whiteboard or teleconferencing product or whatever, the TV just has an Android SoC built right into it, and they're running custom software sometimes, and uh, I think they just keep them maintained for a lot longer than they used to. So, yeah, I, I, I think this era is kind of coming to a close. But nonetheless, I know how nerds are. I got three of these things, even though I have absolutely no use for them. I certainly have enough computers. So if you're excited about the prospect of owning one, I recommend you, you keep an eye out. Uh, don't search for OPS TV or anything. You will never get any results doing that. You wanna look for digital whiteboards. Uh, you wanna look for NEC multi-syncs. Uh, and then you just wanna look in the TV category on Facebook Marketplace and keep an eye out for things with very, very <laughs> rectangular bezels and look up their specifications. Um, it's pretty much the best way to do it. And of course, the two that I've shown you are a bit larger. Uh, but they do actually come in smaller sizes. Some are out there, there's like a 32 inch, but I actually have another NEC that's only a 42 inch, which <laughs> next to even this thing looks dinky. Now, an interesting thing about this one, this thing of course also has an OPS slot, but what's in it is a TV tuner, which I believe is on one of these new SDM cards. So this is actually adapting SDM to OPS. So if you had any questions about whether SDM actually did anything new and novel, the fact that it could just be pin converted to the old thing kinda, kinda suggests otherwise. But now, at least if you see something like this while out thrifting or whatever, you'll know what you're looking at. So I'm sorry for not making this a decade ago when it would have been a bit more useful, but well, at least it's here now. So <laughs> I hope you enjoyed watching it. Uh, if you're new to my channel, um, hi, welcome. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, consider subscribing if you wanna see more stuff like it. I try to make things at least as interesting as often as I can. Uh, but if you wanna make sure I can continue making things like this, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks are doing. Uh, this is my full-time jobs. So they're the only reason that I can afford to do this. They're paying for the space and the stuff and my gas and groceries and, and every other damn thing. So I'm incredibly grateful to all of them for making this possible, but I, I just wanna harp on this again because <laughs> the warehouse space that I'm in now is just a game changer. I have had these TVs, or at least this one, for quite a while. Um, actually, one of my patrons donated this to me, I think six or eight months ago, and I was really excited about it because I was unable to find an OPS TV anywhere. I'd been looking for over a year and nothing was coming up. I had eBay searches and Craigslist and the whole bit. And 
Then I got this thing uh, from this fellow. I'm sorry I forgot your name again, but uh, I already thanked him enough in uh, a patron video. Uh, and since then, since I was able to actually start experimenting and, and learning how this stuff worked, uh, that helped me find more stuff. And now I've got three of these TVs and very soon I'll have more and my girlfriend will break up with me. But that's all in the future. For the moment, this is fantastic. And it's, it's just really only possible because I've got the space to move and breathe and to set things up in the middle of the floor and, and run cables all over the place. And I just couldn't do that uh, in the studio space. It's great for the sitting at a desk talking type videos, but it just wasn't great for this sort of highly active kind of thing. So I just want to thank everybody again. I uh, couldn't do this without you and everybody else. Thanks for watching.